Bankers and Empire, How Wall Street Colonized the Caribbean, Peter James Hudson, The University of Chicago Press, Chicago and London, dedicated to DSG, in memory of Reverend Delanat Pierre. Introduction, Dark Finance. When James Stillman, president of the National City Bank of New York, began searching for a space to replace the bank's cramped and old-fashioned headquarters at 52 Wall Street, he saw a building that could evoke the City Bank's transformation from an early 19th century merchant bank into one of the most powerful financial institutions in the United States. Stillman wanted a building that signified City Bank's new identity while recalling the old. A building that could project strength, stability, and permanence while embodying his almost metaphysical ambitions for the bank's expansion and growth. Instead of constructing a new edifice from the ground up, Stillman decided to purchase and renovate the old U.S. Customs House at 55 Wall Street. 55 Wall Street was built in 1842 as the Merchants Exchange, replacing an older exchange building destroyed during the Great Fire of 1835. The new building was an imposing Greek revival structure of Quincy granite that covered the city block enclosed by Exchange Place and Wall, Hanover, and William Streets. Its Wall Street face was an extended colonnade of 12 30-foot iconic columns, and it was crowned with a dome that was among the most recognizable features on the Manhattan skyline. The U.S. federal government purchased 55 Wall Street in 1862. Stillman and the Citibank took it over in 1899. They would transform it into one of the most opulent baking houses in the United States. Stillman wanted 55 Wall Street remodeled as a temple of finance whose design replicated the Pantheon. He sent a bank officer to Rome for study and hired McKim, Mead, and White, the architectural darlings of the corporate world, to oversee the renovations. The building's interior was dynamited and its rotunda was recast as an expansive banking room appointed in brass, marble, and mahogany and illuminated by electric candelabras. Granite salvaged from the renovations was used to construct a second tier of columns and the facade on top of the first, enclosing the dome, doubling the height of the exterior, and creating an imposing stockade fronting Wall Street. The latest office technologies were installed inside, a vacuum power system of pneumatic tubes for internal messaging a telephone switchboard serving 93 external stations and the bank's employees at their 55 desks, an internal dictograph network connecting the bank's officers and department heads, direct telegraph wires leased from Western Union and the Postal Telegraph Company, linking the bank to its agents and correspondents across the United States. At the center of the room, under the dome's celestial canopy, instead of an altar to the gods of Rome, stood a chapel for the demonic idols of capitalism, the city bank's vault. A strong box, built of 300 tons of armor-plated steel, enclosed in a reinforced steel cage and protected by an elaborate system of rubber tubes, iron bolts, mechanical alarms, and jets that discharge bursts of scalding steam at the mere threat of a thief or burglar, if not a del factor or a corrupt banker. On December 19, 1908, a caravan of clerks, tellers, and runners shouldered leather satchels containing $10,000 each and marched the city bank's half-billion-dollar cash reserve from the old premises at 52 Wall Street across the street to number 55. Days later, the new building was opened to hundreds of city bank employees who, visiting with their families, marveled at the new building and gasped in astonishment and wonder at the towers of gold bars and paper currency stacked within the vault. Critics and commentators fawned over the renovations and commended Stillman for preserving the original facade and bucking current trends in corporate architecture by refusing to erect another Bessemer steel frame skyscraper among those already reconfiguring Manhattan's cityscape. 
there were some reservations concerning the new building. Frank A. Vanderlip, who replaced Stillman as city bank president three weeks after the opening, and who took the doors of the old customs house to Beechwood, his Scarborough on a Hudson estate, had wanted a large modern structure. He anticipated that the fast-growing bank would soon face a crisis of office space, and had gone as far as having plans drafted for a multi-story tower. Others were bothered by less practical concerns. They were bewildered by the decision to stack a second colonnade on top of the first. They viewed the renovation as an aesthetic aberration, a vulgar betrayal of the former perfection of the principles of neoclassical architecture. They saw it as a reflection of the whims and caprice of gauche financiers who wanted to dress up the uncouth and grotesque spaces of modern industrial capitalism with the frills and drapery of Greek and Roman civilization. 55 Wall Street was part of a scourge of neoclassicalism found in the factories, banks, warehouses, and offices whose ersatz evocations of a European classical past as social critic Lewis Mumford observed, tried to conceal the labor exploitation, industrial organization, and monopoly combination of the modern U.S. economy. For Mumford, contemporary business and commercial architecture, mass and imperial enterprise churning behind an imperial facade. 55 Wall Street embody Mumford's descriptions of a debased imperial architecture, its neoclassical detailing and Romanesque veneers cloak the city bank's financial labors within the domestic economy, shrouded its modern office technologies, obscured its ties to the exploitation of oil and railroads and cotton and steel, and viled its connections to the oligopolistic corporations using the bank as their private financier. But hidden behind 55 Wall Street's facade of neoclassicalism was another imperial enterprise, an enterprise of banking, finance, and empire whose ambitions and expansions were braided through the U.S. colonial and neocolonial projects of the early 20th century. While the city bank was undergoing a transition from 19th century merchant bank to 20th century commercial and industrial financier, it was also remaking itself as an international financial institution, where it was once jockeying for business and influence among the brokers, merchants, and commission agents of old New York, the city bank was now muscling its way to a seat at the table of international finance alongside the imperial banking houses of London, Paris, and Berlin and where it once served the financial needs of a fast-growing domestic economy, it was increasingly involved with the banking, trade finance, and debt issuance of the Caribbean, Latin America, and Asia. By the time 55 Wall Street's renovations were complete, Stillman and Vanderlip were recasting their institution as an imperial bank. The city bank's history began to be written overseas, and it increasingly grappled with the conundrums of law and regulation governing international commerce, banking, and finance, as well with the questions of racism and militarism, underwriting U.S. imperialism and finance capitalism. 55 Wall Street's neoclassical facade obscured the modern economic aspects of empire and simultaneously expressed imperialism's racial and cultural orders for Stillman and for Vanderlip and for other members of Wall Street's white financial elite. Neoclassical architecture represented the transmission and transplantation of an Anglo-Saxon heritage to U.S. soil. The evocations of the Pantheon embedded the bank within a European civilizational tradition and joined that tradition to the United States' bloody annals of imperial expansion. Summoning the interlaced history of finance capitalism within racial capitalism, 55 Wall Street stood as an elegant monument to the city bank's cruel imperial history. Buoyed by this newfound wealth, New York City's financial institutions began to look overseas, searching for outlets for their swelling accumulations of unproductive capital. 
They also sought to consolidate Wall Street's international position in finance, trade, and commerce. They viewed the organization of an imperial banking system as a critical component in the rise of New York and the westward traverse of the star of financial supremacy as imperial theorist and financial reformer Charles A. Conant referred to it from Europe to the United States. With these ambitions, bankers and business people set their sights on asserting control over the trade and finance of the Americas. They looked to displace the European joint stock banks that had commanded South American trade since the mid-19th century, lending booms as well as the Canadian charter banks that dominated the financing of North American trade in the British West Indies and the Spanish-speaking islands. U.S. bankers had lagged behind. Their European and Canadian competitors were quick to seize on the region's shifting needs for capital brought on by both the end of slavery and the emergence of nominally free populations of African and indigenous workers and peasants, and by demands for capital by independent post-colonial states seeking to fund their modernization projects. Wall Street's expansion into the Caribbean and Latin America was grafted onto this post-emancipation history of economics and finance as it intersected with questions of national sovereignty, political governance, and the political economy of race, labor, and citizenship. The U.S. government encouraged and supported the internationalization of U.S. banking. The War and State Departments required fiscal agencies to support the infrastructure of U.S. colonialism and financial institutions were an important conduit of colonial policy and financial and commercial diplomacy. Bankers, however, needed little prodding to move overseas and the relations between Wall Street and Washington were contested and contentious. Although foreign policy was often dictated from Lower Manhattan and the federal government, alongside the U.S. military, came to protect U.S. banking and investment abroad, Wall Street often clashed with Washington. Similarly, the U.S. bankers exerted their influence in the national parlances of Port-au-Prince and Havana, and other capitals of the Caribbean and Central America. Local elites sought to use Wall Street for their own ends, and bankers fought among themselves while they often formed alliances, cartels, and consortiums. Competition and rivalry created friction between Wall Street's banking houses, and sometimes within institutions as enmity, ambition, and the caprice of personality played no small part in shaping banking policy. The Citibank was at the center of the history of banking internationalization and imperialism. A federally charted commercial bank, it emerged as the largest and most important imperial financier in the United States. Under Stillman and Vanderlip, the Citibank adopted an aggressive, entrepreneurial, and activist strategy for expansion and growth. Their strategy was in part an attempt to modernize the domestic operations of their institution through a process of internal organizational reconstructions and managerial reform that included the diversification of its domestic financial activities, the decentralization of its management and operations, and a push for the reform of banking regulation. Foreign expansion played a substantial part in the bank's modernization and the most important theater of internationalization was the American Mediterranean, as one city banker described the countries and colonies ringing the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. There, the city bank experimented with the issuance of sovereign debt, the financing of international trade, the funding of industrial infrastructure, and the organization of regional state banks and currency systems. The Citibank also made the Caribbean the centerpiece of the largest foreign branch bank system of any U.S. financial institution as it pushed for a share in a market long dominated by Europe and Canada. 
as part of its efforts in internationalization and in the attempts to create an institution for imperial accumulation, the Citibank hammered away at the banking regulations, shackling its activities and pushed for regulatory reform. In its encounters with the peoples, nations, and colonies of the Caribbean and Latin America, it participated in the creation, replication, and reordering of Caribbean economies on racial lines while helping to reproduce the racist imaginaries and cultures in which finance capital was embedded and through which bankers functioned. The Citibank was not the only U.S. financial institution charting an imperial turn. It was joined by its neighbors on Wall Street, sometimes as collaborators involved in a collective project to consolidate the financial realms of the U.S. Imperium, sometimes as rivals embroiled in bitter intra-imperial competition. The Citibank's efforts were preceded by a small group of unheralded entrepreneurs and institutions that emerged as the pioneers of the internationalization of U.S. banking. These overlooked institutions established U.S. banks abroad and provided financial services for U.S. colonial administrations in the Caribbean and Pacific regions during an era from the 1870s to the 1910s that is largely neglected in the history of the foreign expansion of U.S. banking and business. This era is often seen as an interregnum between the closing of a capital-saturated West at the end of the 19th century and the emergence of the United States as a global creditor during World War II. But it is a period that is important on its own terms, not simply as a precursor of later events. Although fueled by the rhetoric of 19th century Pan-Americanism, by the commercial boosterism of New York City, and by the euphoric pro-imperialist mood following the U.S. victory over Spain in 1898, the success of these institutions rarely matched their ambitions, and their histories read as an archive of experimentation, missteps, and mistakes. The most successful and historically the most important of these institutions were those organized in Cuba and the Dominican Republic by private financier Samuel M. Jarvis. Significant, too, is the International Banking Corporation, parentheses IBC, an institution whose pioneering branch in the Caribbean and Asia was long coveted by the Citibank. Both the Jarvis institutions Ooh. and the IBC were important for their experimental, exploratory, institutional histories, as well as for their role as training grounds for an emergent generation of international bankers. At the same time, from the end of the 19th century, Wall Street's unincorporated and private investment banks, including J.P. Morgan and Company, Spire and Co., and Kuhn, Loeb and Co., began floating the public debt of Caribbean, Latin American, and Asian countries, states, and municipalities, and financing railroad and port projects. Where they had grown in prominence by using their strong European networks and their close family ties as the conduit to market U.S. government bonds and corporate securities across the Atlantic, they increasingly sold Caribbean and Latin American debt in the United States. These private bankers came to play an important role in the policy of dollar diplomacy, initiated by William Howard Taft and his Secretary of State, Philander Knox, in the 1910s. In the attempt to displace European influence and extend U.S. capitalism in the Caribbean region, purporting to replace military intervention with financial diplomacy, private bankers worked with financial experts and local governments to refund sovereign debt, reorganize customs collection and currency systems, and organize nominally national government banks. The disordered global financial and economic conditions unleashed by the First World War accelerated the internationalization of Wall Street and intensified the relationship between banking, bankers, and imperialism.
More than any other institution, the city bank under Vanderlip took advantage of the opportunities provided by the war and ran with the new banking legislation of the Federal Reserve Act, 1913, the federal legislation that modernized the U.S. financial system and created the legal platform for foreign branch and commercial expansion. But the European War also roused other New York City commercial banks, trust companies, and private banks to action, especially in the Americas where European credits, once abundant, were now suddenly scarce. Enabled by new, permissive banking legislation, they partnered with the United States regional and country banks in the formation of foreign finance corporations that rapidly created overseas branch networks and rushed to finance trade and foreign commodities, especially Cuban sugar. The most important of these corporations were the Mercantile Bank of the Americas, organized by Brown Brothers and Company, the J.P. Morgan, controlled by Guarantee Trust Company, and J&W Seligman and Company, and the American Foreign Banking Corporation, organized by the Chase National Bank of the City of New York. This expansion of foreign branches and trade financing was short-lived. Commodity prices soared in the immediate post-war years, sparking a period of speculation and inflation. The period was most pronounced in Cuba, where it is remembered as a dazzling but abbreviated time of prosperity and wealth known as the Danza de los Millones, or the Dance of Millions. But the global drop of commodity prices that marked the end of the Dance of Millions dealt a severe blow to U.S. international banking. It prompted a retreat from branch banking and the dissolution of many of the foreign financial corporations organized to take advantage of the wartime and post-war trade conditions. Meanwhile, the Caribbean's local banking sector, having expanded during the war years, was gutted. North American financial institutions took over the assets and accounts of their vulnerable local rivals, consolidating their dominance in the Caribbean. Cuba, again, was devastated. Neither its financial sector nor its economy would ever recover from the crisis. As a result of the crisis of 1920-21, through 21, banking internationalization and the organization of finance capitalism began to change in form and practice. Sovereign debt financing and the marketing of corporate bond issues superseded commercial trade financing. Thrift emerged as a strategy of expansion and as a new mode of imperial government. Branch banking gave way to the use of securities affiliates as vehicles for imperial accumulation. Securities affiliates, sometimes called bastard affiliates, were parallel institutions of dubious legality organized by national banking associations for investment and the marketing of foreign and corporate debt. They helped facilitate the credit boom of the second half of the 1920s with its unhinged speculation, deranged financing, and massive exportation of capital abroad. The National City Company and the Chase Securities Corporation were the two most important and prominent affiliates. The National City Company was organized by the City Bank. By that time, led by a charismatic former bond salesman named Charles E. The Chase Securities Corporation was organized by the City Bank's emergent and ambitious rival. Albert H. Whitney led Chase National Bank of the City of New York. Through their securities affiliates, the respective parent banks took over the financing of sugar plantations and government banks and the funding of the sovereign debt of the Caribbean and Latin America. The era of internationalization ended in the 1930s. Black Friday and the stock market crash of 1929 led to a crisis of finance capitalism. The crisis sparked a wave of both anti-banking and anti-imperialist sentiment in the United States and the Caribbean. It drew attention 
to the usurious interest rates and suffocating fiscal conditions imposed by bankers on sovereign nations, the strong personal and financial ties between Wall Street and despotic and dictatorial regimes in the Caribbean, the ongoing support for U.S. military occupation by finance capital, and the virtual control of Caribbean industry and agriculture by banking houses. In addition to an outcry over odious debt and calls for the repudiation of loans by Caribbean countries, there were soon demands for both the regulation and reform of banking practices and the nationalization or indigenization of U.S. banks operating in the region. New Deal banking legislation accomplished the former. The securities affiliates of the Citibank and the Chase Bank were dissolved as part of a broader deceleration of international activities and a partial retreat from U.S. imperial banking. A financial crisis sparked the regulatory reform that curtailed the history of Wall Street's internationalization and the expansion of imperial banking. A financial crisis had also enabled internationalization in the first place. Financial crises forced the geographical reorganization of capital accumulation and the territorialization of banking power, initiating the search for new markets and the shift overseas. The response to crisis also came in the calls for the rewriting of the legal underpinnings of the organization of banking institutions. Bankers placed the blame for economic and financial crisis at the feet of outmoded cumbersome and restrictive banking legislation and demanded regulatory reform and the modernization of banking law. They called not for the repeal of regulation, but for its extension, for the organization by the state of a stronger and more efficient regulatory structure to facilitate banking internationalization and global capital accumulation. In fact, the history of the internationalization of U.S. finance and the imperial turn in U.S. banking is in part a history of the transformations and challenges to banking law and the regulation of financial institutions in the national and international context. At the most basic apolitical and historically sanitized level, banks are financial intermediaries whose social function is to link savers with borrowers or investors. Banks are legal entities organized to promote efficiencies of transaction and exchange while enabling the transformation of unproductive hoarded money into active productive capital. Economic expansion and innovation have led to increasingly arcane forms of finance, but they have also led, on the one hand, to specialization spawning over time a range of institutions whose names denote their primary activity, be they commercial banks, government central banks, trust companies, investment banks, or development banks, and on the other hand, to the consolidation and organization of integrated financial department stores and vast multi-unit financial conglomerates International, multinational, and global banking spatializes specialization. At the heart of the theory and practice of international banking are the problems of geography and law as well as a question concerning the intermediation of capital across political borders and across sovereign jurisdictions. Bankers were faced with the problem of creating an entity chartered under one jurisdiction that could operate in another sovereign jurisdiction, a jurisdiction governed by a different autonomous set of laws and under a different legal authority. They sought to organize financial institutions that could work across these distinct jurisdictions and apprehend a territory whose monetary and financial systems were shaped by incommensurable legal codes. Although in many cases, bankers saw themselves as above the law and beyond the sovereign authority of individual states, especially in the Caribbean. For U.S. bankers, this was a particularly difficult problem given the dual nature of the country's banking system. The 1863 National Bank Act 
created two legal categories of financial institutions existing within two different spheres of regulation. National banking associations, joint stock commercial banks such as the Citibank, the national and its name signifying its legal status, were chartered under the act and supervised by the comptroller of the currency. As federal depositories, they could issue national currency, but they were unit banks that were limited to a solitary venue of operation and barred from branch or chain banking. The injunctions against branch banking dated back to fears of territorial monopoly and the 19th century bank wars over Andrew Jackson's Bank of the United States. For Stillman, Vanderlip, and others seeking to move overseas, the restrictions on branch banking proved to be a major obstacle in the internationalization of national banking associations. State banks, on the other hand, did not have access to the monetary reserves of the federal government and could not issue currency. They were allowed to organize branches, although only within the state of incorporation. That said, some bankers found loopholes in the permissive banking laws of states like Delaware, West Virginia, and Connecticut, permitting them to experiment with overseas branch banking. The reorganization of the national banking system through the Federal Reserve Act, signed late in 1913 and operationalized the following year, maintained the dual system and provided the legal infrastructure for foreign branch expansion and the expansion of international commerce and trade. The organization of the Federal Reserve System occurred in part because of the desire to create a domestic financial system with a liquid currency that could attend to seasonal fluctuations in credit demand and stave off the kind of monetary crisis created by the Panic of 1907 when private bankers led by J.P. Morgan, were forced to intervene to save the financial system from collapse. Proponents of a Federal Reserve System argued that a banker's bank, or a banker of last resort, was needed to regulate the country's economy through control of the monetary supply. Their plan was to decentralize capital reserves, to better mobilize credit in response to fluctuations and demand, to expedite the clearance of various forms of securities within a geographical expansive domestic market and to protect the gold reserve so as to maintain the United States ascendant favorable balance of trade. The system was also set up as a way of enhancing the dollar's international standing and to promote it as an international currency. The Federal Reserve Act also contained a number of provisions crucial to the expansion of U.S. banking and markets abroad. It created an international system of discount that facilitated the financing of international trade by national banking associations and provided for the establishment of foreign branch banks. Even with the organization of the Federal Reserve, the difficulties of the dual system were compounded the moment U.S. bankers considered overseas expansion. Jurisdictional authority beyond the United States was often ill-defined, occasionally contradictory and sometimes non-existent, and the legal regimes in which international bankers operated were disorganized, uneven, and plural. For the U.S. imperial banks, a quasi or extra-legal modality was the rule not the exception. They sought to evade the scrutiny of regulators by operating in the seams between legal jurisdictions and the regulatory black holes beyond the reach of sovereign nations and in regions where oversight from creditors, investors, and regulators was obscure and financial regulation was weak. U.S. financial institutions created parallel institutions that could operate within the jurisdictions from which the parent bank was barred. Shadow organizations unknown to regulators that existed outside or in between the normative boundaries of legal authority 
Critical to the history of imperial accumulation and finance capitalism, these shadow organizations were created in consultation with Wall Street's most powerful corporate law firms and its infernally brilliant corporate lawyers, Sullivan and Cromwell, Sherman and Sterling, Curtis, Mallet, Prevost, Rushmore, Bisbee and Stern, and Cravath, Swain and Moore. Prize for their skill and agility in interpreting and rewriting corporate and regulatory code. These firms were retained by New York's banking institutions and oftentimes shared in the spoils and rewards of Wall Street's Caribbean ventures. As bankers like James Stillman and Frank A. Vanderbilt and lawyers like William Nelson Cromwell and John Sterling slouched Ooh. in their mahogany paneled offices and their Zotz Renaissance parlors, sipping scotch amid overstuffed furniture, marble statues, and velvet curtains, sufficed by the smoke of Cuban cigars, and outlined the notional visions of imperial finance on the grounds in the Caribbean and Latin America. Another set of white men were turning the financial abstractions into monetary reality and performing the dirty labors of international banking and empire. These men, individuals like the city banks Roger L. Farnham, John H. Allen, and Joseph H. Durrell, have dwelt in the shadows of the larger-than-life robber barons and wizards of modern finance who have dominated the lore and historiography of U.S. banking. These unheralded and lesser-known figures were curious individuals with their knowledge on foreign languages and extensive travel experience. They were cosmopolitan in a way most Americans of the time were not, even as they were still shaped by many of the racial and cultural prejudices of their compatriots. Always white, always male, half frontiersman, half accountant, more hardened than the gentlemanly capitalists of the city of London, less knowing than the economic hitmen of popular literature. They were rogue bankers who entered the profession with little formal experience and often with no formal training. Some began as journalists and reporters, others started as the managers of country banks on the U.S. frontiers. Most eventually drifted to New York City and onto the Caribbean and Latin America and back again, finding employment in the U.S. Imperial banks operating throughout the region. In the case of Terrell, he left behind a set of private papers that provides unparalleled access and insight into the history of U.S. imperial banking in the first decades of the 20th century. Rogue bankers shouldered the burdens of internationalization and imperial banking. Through their labors, the tattered and frayed legal geography of early 20th century international finance was suttered together. The abstraction of finance capital was rendered in material form, and the economies of the Caribbean were inscribed in the account ledgers of Wall Street. Through these bankers, the intimacy of finance capital and racial capitalism in the U.S. Caribbean encounter can be most clearly discerned. Racial capitalism suggests both the simultaneous historical emergence of racism and capitalism in the modern world and their mutual dependence. White rogue bankers not only carried U.S. racial prejudice to the Caribbean, but instrumentalized white racism in imperial banking policy and practice through their everyday encounters and transactions with Caribbean peoples, whether they were Spanish-descended business people in Havana, black and mulatto elites in Port-au-Prince, African Braceros and Hornaleros in Santiago de Cuba and Colón, Indian peasants in Managua, or even the white Canadians and Europeans that often staff the overseas branches of U.S. banks. Importantly, the question of racism here is not merely one of individual beliefs, but one of institutional policy, not simply one of personal sentiment, but one of political economic structure. 
as institutions like the Citibank and the Chase Bank established Caribbean branches and agencies, lent money to sugar planters and commercial exporters, funded sovereign debt, and took over central banking functions. Their actions were shaped and structured by domestic patterns of racial thinking and racist perception. Their profits came in the form of both shareholder dividends and the reproduction of global white supremacy. Racial capitalism's representations often appeared in strange forms within the banking community. Take for instance its appearance in the Citibank Minstrel Show, organized by the City Bank Club, the educational and social organization for the bank's white employees. The City Bank Minstrel Show saw members of the bank staff donning blackface and coon outfits and performing musical and comedic skits for their peers. From 1911 until the late 1920s, the show was held at 55 Wall Street. During one performance on Saturday evening, March 28, 1914, an enraptured audience of almost 2,000 people witnessed the transformation of the main banking room, so carefully renovated to replicate the Pantheon into a southern plantation. They saw an opening scene of several darkies, their co-workers at the city bank, their white faces blackened with burnt cork, rather on the shore of a river engaging in the colored man's national pastime, shooting craps, followed by a program of skits and songs. The city bank staff performed songs such as Down in Monkeysville and That's Plenty, as well as popular tunes including The Gibson Coon, Oh You Coon, Go Away Mr. Moon, there's a little bit of monkey in you and me. The arrival of the emerald pair from Ethiopia. Come back to Alabama. And how's every little thing in Dixie? And what was described as true darky style. They were joined over the years by a roster of black caricatures. Pink costume coons, beautiful dusky queens in black and yellow watermelon costume. Wearing a real 90 carat, one beat, two part snip three potato diamonds, and a vainglorious and flamboyant figure called the Darktown Multimillionaire. The City Bank Mistral Show was in many ways an unremarkable product of its era. It was a sign of the ambiguity of such performances that other Wall Street institutions from the National Bank of Commerce to the Chase Bank also organized several minstrel shows. These institutions also use blackface waiters and performers at social events. A blackface troupe called the Darktown Agony Quartet performed at the Guarantee Trust Company's second annual dinner and blackface waiters served as a banquet held by the National Bank of Commerce at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Bankers also staged orientalist pageants like Chin Chin China Maid and performed ostentatious rituals for staffers initiated into make-believe Asian lodges. Racist stories, jokes, and anecdotes about Asians, Jews, Native Americans, and African Americans regularly appeared within the pages of bank publications, as well as in the trade and professional journals of the time. Often, as in the story, Dark Finance, their humor came from casting black people as economic illiterates, whose engagements with modern banking and finance were marked by repeated incomprehension, befuddlement, and vexation. Published in The Chase, the house organ of the Chase Bank, Dark Finance depicted two African Americans fighting over the meaning and value of a promissory note. Its punchline rested on the assumption of black financial illiteracy. In the malformed worlds of race and money, in the world of dark finance, Wall Street rendered African Americans muddling their way through the everyday economic situations that most whites apparently took for granted. These signs and figures traveled far beyond Wall Street. As they moved into the Caribbean, bankers rendered the region for the same racist troops and narratives in which African Americans were cast. White representations of African Americans were exported to the West Indies and inscribed in a vast archive of pamphlets, reports, circulars, press releases, 
prospect uses, and journal articles produced by Wall Street about the Caribbean and Latin America. Furthermore, in their dispatches back to the United States, published in the journals, monographs, and pamphlets issued by Wall Street, bankers translated the Caribbean to U.S. business people, investors, and the general public. In some cases, debunking stereotypes as a means to encourage investment and others replicating and reconstituting racial stereotypes to further the expansion of white supremacist control of the region. Its returns and accounting found not in the rational extraction of values, but in the ledger of white racial dominance. The city bank's John H. Allen offers but one example of this practice of racial capitalism representation, circulation, and reproduction. Allen aided the bank's expansion into Cuba and Argentina and was the manager of the Citibank, controlled Bank National of La Republic of Haiti. He is perhaps best known for his 1930 article recounting William Jennings Bryan's decision making in the lead up to the landing of U.S. Marines in Haiti in 1915. In the article, Allen describes briefing Bryan on Haiti's history and politics. After listening carefully to Ellen's comments, Brian responded, Dear me, think of it. N words speaking French. Years earlier, in the city bank's foreign trade journal, The Americas, Ellen evoked a picture of Haiti that would have been recognizable to white U.S. audiences before its tropical difference. Ellen asserted that cockfighting and car playing are the Haitian national pastimes, and these together with a supply of Haitian rum are all that is necessary for a Haitian citizen's perfect day. He claimed that during his visits to Haiti, he found that humorous incidents were of almost daily occurrences. For Allen, such incidents showed the naivety and also the restricted mentality of the Haitian people which later was plainly noticeable even among the more highly educated. He supported his claims with anecdotal evidence gleaned from his interactions with one of the employees of the Bank National of the Republic of Haiti. One day, the employee stated that after careful thought, he was convinced that if he continued working as previously, he would not survive the strain many months longer. That he had a large family who would be left penniless Therefore, he was not justified any longer in running the risk. If, however, his salary were increased, he would be warranted in continuing the risk. <laughs> I told him that I was sure he was mistaken and suggested he continue as before as no salary increase was possible. That if he tried it, and it proved to be fateful, he would have the satisfaction of knowing he was right. If, however, he did not die, he would know his apprehension was unfounded, and therefore the increase requested not warranted. He came back the next day saying that he had thought it over and concluded my suggestion was a fair one. Such anecdotes, stories, narratives, and representations did not exist in a vacuum, and they were not merely an incidental cultural membrane stretched over the inner workings of banking, racial capitalism, and imperialism. They contributed to the ideological and cultural rationales through which the Caribbean became the subject of the internationalizing and imperial efforts of Wall Street's banks and at the same time fashioned the racial, economic, legal, and governmental terms through which the Caribbean was encountered. These representations were underwritten by the direct and indirect forms of violence that brought the Caribbean under Wall Street's imperial sway by coercive diplomacy, military force, and labor impressment, as well as by the terms and conditions of credit and debt, the imbalanced application of law and legal regulation, and the imposition of modern forms of post-emancipation financial governance. As the Darktown Agony Quartet was entertaining the staff, of the Guarantee Trust Company, the Guarantee Subsidiary, the Merchantile Bank of the Americas, rushed to build a Caribbean-wide chain of agencies and branches 
At the same time, dark finance appeared in the Chase. The Chase Bank's American Foreign Banking Corporation had just ended a disastrous experiment in foreign trade financing and banking operation in Cuba, Panama, the Dominican Republic, and Haiti. And the Chase Bank itself was about to embark on a speculatory calamitous period of sovereign debt financing in Cuba. As plantation scenes were staged on the marble floors of 55 Wall Street and the city bank minstrels played in the shadows of the steel vault and jigged under the Romanesque dome, Roger L. Farnham, John H. Ooh. Allen, Joseph H. Durrell, and other rogue bankers fought for the city bank's control of the banking and finances of Cuba, Haiti, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic. The following chapters recount this dark history of bankers and empire.